People said that you gave up the business after your album, John Fogarty in 75. Is that true? Yes. Oh, <laughs> actually, no, it's not true. Um, I had to withdraw from the limelight at that point uh, because of various legal and kind of financial involvements that came, that came along with the success of Credence. And um, that's all been pretty well documented, and we don't have a that kind of time here to talk about it. But I really had to go back and start working on um, my music privately. Uh, it was, I was in a situation where I was sort of forced to do it that way. So I accepted the challenge and started climbing up the mountain from the bottom. And, and now you've, uh, you're, you're starting on your new album. I mean, hasn't the music business gotten harder and you know tougher to, to break through? I would. If I was just a totally unknown person right now and about 20 years old, uh, I think, and knowing what I know now, I think it'd be, um, it, I'd feel differently. It'd be real tough, I think. There's, there's so many bands and there's so many names and you know all about them even if you don't hear the music. I just think there's a lot more, uh, I don't think it was competition, but there's just a lot more activity and more people, more records coming out all the time. But do you feel like you have to fight harder to, to really make it than when you were with CCR? Oh, no. Personally, I don't feel that way at all. It's, it's, a, to it's a totally uh, self-contained fight. I have to please myself before um, I try to please anybody else with the music. And happily, when, when I'm able to really hit the spot uh, and find something that I like, it seems to go well. You know, if I turn that into a record and put it out. But uh, I, don't think it, I don't think of it as in terms uh, of, a, of a fight out there or in competition with anybody else at all. What ideas are you trying to put across with, uh, with Centerfield? Well, the, the central theme, really, I would say, is uh, hope and optimism. Is it, I mean, is that what you want for the next few years? Uh, I think it's an overall thing. Uh, you know, to me, the, there's a in one of the uns most unassuming songs is Rock and Roll Girls. But the opening line is um, almost a, my philosophy of life. Uh, the, the trick is to ride and make it to the bell. And to me, what that means is uh, you're supposed to get all the way to the end, I mean, of life, standing up. Uh, no excuses, no groveling. Um, you know, no laying your thing off on somebody else. And uh, that's kind of the whole point of Center Field, it, it, the, as an album, I mean. And also uh, in the way I've tried to live my own life. You know, you, there's always hope. As long as you're trying, there's hope. Mm -hmm. um, if you have a goal or a dream, just stick to it, hang on to it. Let's make a big jump back to the way you started off in the music business. Tell me, tell me how that happened. Well, I'm not sure wh at what point you'd say I started. Well, your, your first band. Okay. Um, well, I met, the, I met Doug in the eighth grade, junior high school. And uh, what it was is I used to go down to the music room every day after school and play the piano. And Doug started dropping by. You know, it'd be a lot of kids there, but Doug started dropping by a lot, as did several other people. And I'd be playing Do You Want to Dance and What I Say and Flight of the Bumblebee and things like that. And uh, he started talking about drums one day. And we, like, we walked home because we lived on this, the same trail, the same, you know, walk, same way to get home. And it made it sound like he had a set of drums and everything. So I said, well, sure, let's come, let's come by your house and see your set. Well, it turned out he had a cousin or somebody who played a snare. Anyway, he had one snare drum, and he put it in a flower pot stand. This is one of these modern art kind of things. It came up like that. And he laid the drum in it, and that was all he had. And here I thought he had a, like a set of drums in his living room or something. We borrowed a hi-hat 
which is, I mean, it was, the, somebody had welded this thing together. It was just this ungodly piece of machinery. And we, we borrowed that, and uh, I brought over my little Sears and Roebuck amp and a guitar, and we started playing. So <laughs> it was very basic, but in the eighth grade, we thought it was pretty good. And sometime during that same period of time, I had, actually, I had tried out three or four different piano players. And um, Stu Cook was, it wasn't that he was the best piano player at that point, but it seemed like he would learn the most, and also he was kind of the most like us. He was the easiest first to get along with. He seemed to have kind of a similar background. So that was really the basis of, our, we would call ourselves the Blue Velvets in those days. Tommy Fogarty and the... And well, eventually Tom joined, but he didn't really start performing with us a lot until two or three years later. Now you were helping out your, your big brother. You know, what, what kind of repertoire did you, did you play? We were pretty much like any American garage band of those days. You have to understand, like in, in junior high, we were the only band in the school. And when we got to high school, I think there was one other rock and roll band. Just, they were just graduating and leaving when we got there. It wasn't like how it was after the Beatles when it seemed like every school had 50 bands. Um, we were the band of the school. We played all the kind of instrumentals. Particularly, we, we concentrated on instrumentals like Dwayne Eddy or The Ventures. Um, we played Torque by The Fireballs. And uh, a lot of things that I sort of arranged for our little trio because we, we ended up playing a lot of weddings and uh, bar mitzvahs. Yeah, all that sort of thing, little dances and stuff. So we, we wanted some more kind of um, classy sort of music. I mean, you might say danceable or adult music like uh, Five Foot Two and uh, My Blue Heaven. And as dumb as that was, you, you begin to learn about kind of a broader spectrum of music than just listening to your, your one top 40 station. You learn that there's a lot more going on it, when you appeal, when you try to appeal to a uh, larger audience. So even at the age of 14, we were sort of trying to be a dance band rather than just a bunch of greasers making noise. How about the vocals? I mean, did you start singing around that period for the for the I vocals? sang very, very little in those days. And uh, it was like before my voice changed even. And so I would do Hully Gully and, oh, I can't remember some of the other ones. We did some blues songs, but my, I had this squeaky little voice that was kind of funny, actually, to be singing. Okay. Uh, I didn't really start singing seriously till I was about 19 or 20 years old. And what kind of songs were you singing then? Well, then it was, I took a, a trip up to Oregon with a couple other musicians in the summer of 64 and kind of discovered my voice. Um, I, I had a little tape recorder. In those days, it was reel to reel. And I would, I just would lay it on the stage. And I put the microphone uh, somewhere near the monitors. And, and the, you know, it's one little mic where it could pick up the drums and the guitar and everything, but also get the vocal. And I'd take that tape home and listen to myself. And I did this every single day. It was great training. I, you know, I'd listen to how I approached a song like, uh, I think, let's see, we did uh, Let's Go, Let's Go was one of the songs we used to do. I'm sure we did What I Say and a couple of Wilson Pickett songs. And I was listening to myself develop an edge, a kind of this uh, harshness. And so I'd listen each day, and then I'd kind of, well, how, what could I do to fix that up or get a little better sound? And that night, you know, I'd have the tape recorder there again, and I'd try it when we tried that song again. And over the course of a, that summer, um, I really kind of developed what later became my style. But it, was, it, it evolved out of this opportunity to hear it every single day and wonder what made it, you know, what I could do to push it and make it better. Oh, this all happened in 1964, but this time you were in a different band. Well, I never considered myself away from the Blue Velvets. Um, that was the main band. I, it was like a marriage almost. I mean, even in, in the eighth and ninth grade, I was committed to that band, even though there was quite a period of time that the other guys weren't, as a matter of fact. They went off to college and got girlfriends and all the rest of it, you know. But I always thought this was the, it, this was the real band. And I'd go off on these other side endeavors, but that wasn't 
ever, in my mind anyway, intended to be anything more than a diversion. The the song Brown Eyed Girl, you uh, you did that in 64, but that was with a different band, though. Oh, no, this was uh, the Gollywogs. It yeah. was uh, Doug and Stu and myself and you my brother Tom. Just changed the name. That's right. Actually, we didn't change the name. We thought we were the Blue Velvets. <laughs> but by the time that record came out, I, it was either the end of 64 or early 65. Uh, it said Gollywogs. <laughs> we were flabbergasted. Uh, I didn't even know what a Gollywog was. I'm not sure I do now. But... Um, we sort of labored under that name, but we never liked it. After that, I mean, what happened? You know, the British uh, invasion was coming on. What happened uh, to the Gollywogs or the Blue Velvets, for that matter? Well, the Gollywogs were actually named that by a, um, a man at the record company because of the British invasion. He thought it sounded British, beetly, and all the rest. Uh, and that was the reason. But um, we were. I mean, we were totally going away from being ourselves. We wore these silly little white hats and, you know, funny mod clothes and the whole thing, like a lot of other kids in America did, trying to emulate the English thing. Um, I'd say the best thing during that time for us was that we were traveling around California doing these very minor hit records that the Gollywogs had. You know, we were big in Turlock and Modesto and sometimes Marysville. And uh, we were touring as a unit, the four of us, driving all around up and down the state, which is almost like driving in England on the M1. I mean, it's, the distances are pretty enormous to a little uh, Volkswagen van that's about on its last legs all the time. Mm -hmm. So I think it just that experience helped make us uh, gel. We were together an awful mm -hmm. lot. And we'd talk about music an awful lot. And in 67, the band changed name again. Did, did the <laughs> record company decide on that? No. We, uh, I got out of the Army in uh, 67. And we sort of resolved to really, you know, as adults, as grown-ups anyway, at the age of 22, um, to really go for it, to either we were, we were really going to commit ourselves and everything we had or else we weren't going to make it. So we pooled all, whatever resources we had. Doug and Stu moved into a place together, actually. Stu sold his car for uh, cash to help us buy equipment. Um, and we all kind of made a uh, last ditch, this is really it, we're going you know, to go for broke, try everything we can. And one of the things we did at that point was to also say, look, that name is awful. Yeah, we got to have a better name than that because this is, this is, we're going for the big time now. This isn't this silly little game of a, a stupid uh, record company guy. You know, I mean, the record company was, um, the entire thing would fit in a couple of those uh, <laughs> planters out there. I mean, it, it, there was, just call it a postage stamp record company would be to give it a, uh, a euphemism. And right at that point, the ownership had changed to the present ownership of Fantasy Records. And so it meant that we no longer had to keep that name. It was the old people that wanted us to use that name. So at that point, we called ourselves Freedom Clearwater Revival. And we're, we were able to go in uh, with two hours of studio time shortly thereafter and record a demo tape, which is the same version of that is Suzy Q on the album. But at first, it was just a demo tape that we took to the local FM station, and they started playing it a lot, like four or five times a day, and in, in exactly the same form that it appears on the record. Well, that, of course, increased our notoriety around uh, the Bay Area and finally around California. Uh, we started getting to play larger and larger venues just because of this demo tape. And wisely, the man at the record company finally saw, oh, well, these guys are getting popular. Maybe they should make an album. Right. So uh, we got to go in and with uh, something like seven or eight hours of studio time, <laughs> uh, we made the first album. It, the budget was like less than $2,000. And uh, the album 
became a hit, and we sort of took off from there. And who who uh, was the leader of Creedence Clearwater Revival? Tom or you? Um, if, if you can speak of a leader, that is. Well, somewhere between the time I got at, somewhere between the time I went in the army and the time when I came out of the army, it sort of evolved and changed because Tom, being older, had always sort of taken a leadership role whenever it was the four of us together. But of course, all those years through high school and junior high, I was the leader of the trio, the Blue Velvet. And Tom would only sort of, two, three times a year, he'd come and sing with us, something like that. Or we'd try and make a demo record. This was like from 1959 till 1966. So that basically, I was the leader of the trio all during those years. And we were much more active. Tom kind of didn't really perform with us a lot. But when I got out of the Army and we all really kind of were serious about it, that I became the leader at that point. Does that mean that you kind of kept everything together as well? Well, it's simply because I was the, bis the uh, music leader and eventually the sort of management leader. I don't know what else to call it. Creedence always used to say we had no manager. But 50% um, of the things I was doing was music, and the other 50% was some it was business related. And now that I'm an older person, I would call that management, even though we didn't have a separate guy with a plaid coat and a cigar, you know, uh, doing these, making these decisions. Okay, um, at the time you were working in San Francisco, you know, it was the flower power uh, era. How come CCR wasn't playing psychedelic music or underground? I never really liked that stuff very much, and it seemed very transient. Um, I, well, actually, right now I can't even think of one. <laughs> Uh, flower power type record that I like. Um, I'm sure there were a few then, but I was more into Stax Volt, Booker T and the MGs, and Otis Redding, and uh, James Brown, and you know all the great kind of R and B stuff, or else country. And psychedelic was always sort of this watered down kind of middle class, skinny little white boys trying to sound heavy and be laid back. You know, <laughs> wow, groovy. And uh, I just couldn't identify with that. But, but wasn't the psychedelic music selling a lot of records at that time? Didn't you? That say may or may not be true. I'm not. I don't even know if that's true or not. I just know that when I would go to the Fillmore and go to uh, to see, quote, the famous uh, psychedelic bands, most of the time they'd put me to sleep. Um, there's, they'd play like 15 minute long jams and things, and you, you know. <laughs> I went and saw Frank Zappa in The Mothers of Invention, and I sat on the, I had to sit on the floor because, it's because the other half of the show was Booker T and the MGs, and that's why I went. But the first half was Frank Zappa, Mothers of Invention. And I mean, it was the most boring thing I've ever seen. And at one point, he stood there, and another guy too, and they talked about their 57 Chevy and mag wheels and something like that while the music was going. And he talked for like 25 minutes. I got really agitated. And so did everybody else. Well, Next day, I read in the paper that he does that on purpose, or he did yeah. that, to make us all mad, just to see what it would be like. And I, gee, I didn't pay three dollars to, you know, to get all mad. I wanted to hear great music from Booker T. It, it was one of the weirdest presentations, and I know he's a pioneer because a lot of people do that now. Yeah. <laughs> he still does it, as a matter of yeah. fact. Uh, CCR became world famous. Who wrote the hits? I mean, I'm talking like Sisu Q, Put a Spell on You, Proud Mary, Born on the Bayou, Bad Moon Rising. Well, with the exception of the first two, I, I began to write. Uh, in the beginning, like Suzy Q is a great old Dale Hawkins song. He helped write it, but there were some other people. Scream and Jay Hawkins did I Put a Spell on You. And uh, that's another great old uh, R&B song that I loved. And it happened to fit my vocal style. I could, I could sing that well, and that was the reason uh, we decided to do that particular song. But somewhere between the first and second album, I discovered that um, I sort of evolved. I mean, I'd always been trying to write music. But somewhere during that summer of 67, I started really coming up with things, like Proud Mary was during that time, Born on the Bayou. Um, it was this kind of little mythical invention of the Louisiana swamp rock and all that sort of thing. Um, sort of came out. It, it, was, it was a concentration of about two months' time of songwriting, staying up all night, thinking about 
where did we sit in American rock, that sort of thing. And it, it evolved right then. What, what are your favorites of the ones you wrote? Um, probably they, Green River. I like the place that that song's supposed to be coming from. Green, Green River, I always thought, was like the heart and soul of what Credence is. Uh, musically and also just kind of what it's talking about. The, that whole album and specifically that song. Okay, you wrote them. How about the arrangement? The same thing, yeah, I, I would work those out. How about uh, Tony Joe White? What influences did he have? Oh, I would say he had probably no influence on us. We liked him, but he was sort of parallel. He came along at the same time we did. We toured with him. He's a great guy. He's wonderful. Now we're moving along into the 70s, early 70s, something went wrong. What happened exactly? Well, I went out to get gas one day. <laughs> I came back, and the house was gone. Somebody put cement in my swimming pool. I don't, I don't, uh, I think what, really the simplest way to say it is every band evolves to the same place. Because I've seen it, I'm going to open up a clinic on Sunset Boulevard, Fogarty's, Fogarty's House of Fame or something, and I'm going to counsel all these young bands who, you know, well, he's got blonde hair and that makes you jealous, doesn't it? He sings all the vocals and that makes you jealous, doesn't it? I mean, it's like all this silly stuff happens. You're referring uh, to to your brother Tom? No, I was referring to all bands. All bands that they. What happens is you got a band of guys, they start out, there's no success, so the sky's the limit. Everybody wants to get there. Then you have success. At first, you're knocked out by it. It's great, it's wonderful. After a year or so, you accept that as a normal condition. That's the first mistake right there. This is not a normal condition. You probably, I can guarantee you will probably be a has-been within three years. Mm -hmm. If you don't, you're very extremely lucky. Well, anyway, so you start accepting this fame and this notoriety as a normal state of affairs, and it's going to go on forever. That's the second mistake. Finally, you start the band as a whole starts feeling that, you know, each individual starts thinking that he is the important cog. And since if that is true, then I should start singing the songs, or at least writing these songs. He shouldn't have to write all the songs. I'm going to write all the songs now. I mean, every band in the world does this. And if you allow that to happen, the thing you started with is going to be different. Right. <laughs> it's going to change. You know, sports guys know this. They get to the World Series, they say, let's go with what got us here. And they put in their ace, and he mows them down. But bands don't know that. They get to the top, the World Series. Then they bring in the water boy. <laughs> and they say, all right, water boy. You sing all the tunes from now on. And they, you know, the audience goes, arf. Um, I mean, we did it. That's uh, what happened to us. And I've seen it happen time after time. It's a, it's a fatal mistake, but it's like a moth to a flame. Everybody seems to want to do it that way. So you continue as, as a trio? But that well, just think of all those solo albums you get, though. First, as a band, you're only getting one or two albums a year. You got a five-piece band. That's five, six solo albums every year. Right, 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 right. <laughs> uh, mm. No, but uh, the trio didn't last long, right? That's no, I mean that was really like we didn't know what to do. You know, we we started as a trio. There we were. We were we were a trio again, but that was kind of um, it was already we had passed our Rubicon. You know, our bridge too far. Um, the rules were different now. It was a democracy. Everybody, I was not the leader anymore. Everyone was going to sing. Everyone was going to write. Everyone was going to arrange. Uh, true democracy, just like um, Athens, you know. Uh, so it was chaos, and it collapsed under its own weight. Right. Your solo career started. First, there was an album by the Blue Ridge Rangers. Who All those guys were wanted to they? sing and write too. <laughs> but who were they? That was basic. That was me overdubbing. Just. That was a one-man band. <laughs> okay, that album, man, your solo album in 1975, were praised by the critics. Nevertheless, you stopped. I'm not so sure it was praised, but. Uh, well. That's okay. I'm they, not they, fishing. They, anyway, no, no, I, they, I look back at that album not. and I go, uh, hmm, yeah. I, it was a it was a blind man in a fog is what it was. But why did you stop? Um, 
I started to make a, an, another album after that, and it was even worse. It was never released, and Joe Smith, the uh, head of Asylum Records that I was now on, said, uh, this really doesn't sound like it's up to par, John. Why don't you go home and straighten out all these other things you're involved in? First, you don't have to make a record now. You know, just, just ease that out of your mind. You don't have to. You don't owe anybody anything. Why don't you straighten out this other baloney? He didn't say baloney, but that's what it was. And um, that's what I did. I went home and started to attack kind of all these nagging financial and legal problems that up until this time I had just sort of been running on a treadmill trying to get to where the career would you know, ignite again. And since I was now relieved of that sort of burden or, or uh, pressure, I started to really attack these things, one of which was this great financial plan that uh, the people at Fantasy had gotten us involved in. And as soon as I started kind of tapping around the shadows of this thing to find out, well, where's all the money? Um, how much did we earn? How much was spent? How much is left? Uh, as soon as I did that, it all disappeared. <laughs> it's just, right. boom, gone. It was it, like within weeks. So, um, and then I realized that I still owed product to Fantasy Records, and they were somehow connected to this bank, and the whole thing got real um, vague, is a good word. And uh, so I decided I'd better put lawyers on the case and uh, kind of fight this thing out before I make any more records. And that's basically what I've been doing for 10 years. Okay, but now you're up on the go. What are your plans for the future? Um, I was going to try and be funny, but there's no point to it. Uh, I really am very anxious to get out in the world, tour, all the rest of it. Um, but I will make another album before I do go touring. The basic reason is I'm not going to do the old songs. And since I'm not going to do the old songs, I'm going to only going to do new songs, or at least new to me. Um, I need quite a lot of more material than the nine songs that appear on Center Field before I can tour. But do you think that the people that will go to a, a concert, that they'll still expect a CCR song here? Well, maybe I'll have to print it right on the ticket. Uh, this is not CCR, uh, because it isn't, actually. And even though I was a, uh, a, a large part of what CCR was, after all, I wrote the songs and sang them and that sort of thing, um, I'm also the guy that had to live for the last 12 or 13 years with the knowledge that the, the benefit of my life's work all went to somebody else. And besides that, he also was holding on to me for the future. It was like a, a bear trap around my ankle holding me to a chain to the wall in the basement. And that didn't make me real happy. OK, uh, yeah. So we have to change dates. I'm ready to. We'll pick it up at the tour. Um, you're going to be touring again? What, oh, yes. What can people expect from a concert by John Fogarty? Boy. Oh, about an hour and a half of intensity. <laughs> but no CCR songs? No, I really don't uh, intend to do that, those songs again. Um, basically because they didn't, as, as much joy as they may have brought to uh, people, you know, outside of my own room, uh, the result that happened to me because uh, th those songs were owned by the record company uh, and that record company treating me and the other guys the way they did, it didn't bring us a lot of joy at all. And it's all kind of mixed up inside. I, <clears throat> I just assume not sing them anymore. OK, and how about for the future for you? I mean, besides touring? Well, I intend to make another album before I would go out. And um, that involves uh, finding a lot of new music that I do feel joy about. And one of the wonderful things that happened because of um, making the album Center Field, and also it's kind of wrapped up in my relationship here with uh, Warner Brothers. It's finding a lot of people that really care, that really try hard. You know, I, had, I hadn't had that experience before, to tell you the truth. And there is a lot of joy for me now. I, I love singing. And, um, 
I love the whole kind of idea of creating something that's going to be appreciated and then put into a, a media or, a, or into a form that's going to be um, appreciated. So I'm really having a lot of fun right now. This is just great right now for me. Okay. You like it like that? Fine. Okay. Should we do the the logos, Rob? No. No, I'm just keep going. I want to be on TV as well. So. Over yeah, <laughs> over this way to your right, Rob. Sorry. To your right. This. In the other corner. There you this go. Way? Bingo. It's a beauty. Thank you. <laughs> There's one of those people right there. <laughs> okay. Old man down the road. The video clip is exquisite. Did you think of that, the concept yourself, or? No, that if if you call that a concept, um, was basically an idea that evolved out of uh, the director Mick Haggerty and Jeff Aroff here at Warner Brothers and myself talking about you know what what did we want to do with a video basically I think we all agreed that I, we didn't want it to be just your ordinary uh, lots of flesh and a bombs going off type video so um, we started talking about this idea of following a continuous chord and that appealed to me just because it was kind of different and off the wall um, at one point I realized there was no swampiness in there though and I really wanted a swamp in there because uh, especially the opening lines of Old Man sound like it came right out of a great old swamp, great old bog in the fog. And uh, so that became necessary. But I wouldn't, s I had really, I was not the central idea in this at all. I had a lot of fun uh, being there and helping to make the thing, though. It was a lot of fun. Tell you what, we'll take a look at it right now. Okay. <laughs> 